Are Greg and Maya professional reviewers? Absolutely not. Like, amateurs at best, but it's okay because they're funny, smart, and kind of adorable. Bless their hearts. So sit back, relax, and tune into this week's episode of All Cued Up. Hello guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome to All Queued Up, the review podcast tied to streaming services. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the Doctor Who Special 3, uh, The Giggle. I was like, there's a title to it. Uh, we're going to talk about the Game Awards briefly, and I have a, my topic discussion. So let's go ahead and start with um, the uh, the Game Awards. All but right. First, but first, but first. I gotta look at my notes because I've redone this for our soft reboot. But first, uh, I'm Greg. That's Maya. How's your week been? It's been pretty awesome. Um, pretty laid back. Uh, pretty uh, pretty low key. Well, we did have a couple of things. You know, I got all of my Christmas shopping done. So I thought, <clears throat> and then. Ended up buying Misty a couple more things. And then Madison was panicking nervous about her SOLs. uh, Standard learning tests that they have in the state of Virginia for certain classes that are required to pass. I thought you were going to say that she was worried about her shit out of luck. So I was like, I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah. They they are referred to as standards of learning tests. And in the state of Virginia, they have set up. In certain grades, not every grade, but certain grades, you have SOLs that you have to take for specific subjects in order to advance to the next grade, which is pretty fucking stupid. And the teachers, you know, put tremendous undue amounts of pressure on the kids. Like, your life is over if you don't pass this fucking course. That's essentially the way they talk to them and treat them, and it's bullshit. Uh, so all the weekend, the days leading up to her SOLs, she had two to take. I think she had to take one for biology and the other one for English, but I'm not sure, not 100%, but I know her biology when she was really freaking out, panicking. And she goes to school that morning. She gets done She with the test. She's already cried a couple of times. Then she finds out that she made the highest score in the grade. So naturally, we go get her uh, because there's no reason to leave her at school because they're still doing SOL testing. She's just going to sit in the classroom and not doing anything. So we go get her at school, we pick up a pizza, we're happy, we're celebrating with her. You know, we decide to reward her with, uh, you know, one gift early. Normally I let her open up a gift on Christmas Eve. I said, I'll let you open up your Christmas Eve gift now. And I picked one out for her and it was a framed canvas poster of Lana Del Rey. Uh, one of her concert tours, something that she had picked out and specifically put on a list. And uh, she just looked at it and I was like, I don't know what's wrong. And apparently I don't know what the specifics are. She hasn't explained to me yet, but she no longer supports Lana Del Rey because of her stance on Israel. Uh, apparently, she, maybe I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure, but regardless, I don't want to give her gifts that make her sad. So I replaced the two gifts. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Other than that, just been playing uh, Star Ocean, the last hope 4K remaster uh, on PS5. It's 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 got a different feel from the earlier Star Ocean games, uh, but has enough. To, uh, of a Star Ocean feel to make it feel like a Star Ocean game. It just, it feels removed and it, the difficulty level is much harder. Gotcha. Uh, 
for instance, you know, in the first Star Ocean games, uh, First Departure R and Second Story R, they have coliseums, and you battle through the coliseums, and, you know, the coliseum battles can be tough, uh, and they're usually not possible to advance in them until late in the game. Um, and, like, there are several modes. In Second Story R, there's, like, okay, we go through the ranking system, like, rank F through A, you know, you get a fight, six rounds of fights or a survival mode. You have to survive 50 battles in a row. However, if you fail, you can always restart at the midway point, you know, like level 26 through 50. That's no problem, you know, because they're quick fights. This one here, you're, you start out at rank 101, and you have to advance to rank number one, individual fights. Um, and it's not just quick fights. Like Once you get to, well, the difficulty ramps up. Right now, I'm ranked number 11, and you can fight up to two ranks ahead of your ranking. Uh, so if I'm level 11, I can fight the... Uh, 10th, 9th, and 8th level fighter. The 8th level fighter in here, oh my god, it's one hit killing me. And I'm ranked, I'm like level 78 or 9 in the game with my main character. Mm -hmm. And I can fight pretty well. You know, you just got to figure out what's going on with this thing. You pretty much have to fight perfectly. There's no room for error. Uh, I can wail on it and wail on it and the instant you let up or if you overcommit to where it's called a rush attack a rush attack can break through anything if you overcommit and you start attacking when they start their rush attack you're dead so that's been a frustrating morning <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no I'm trying to think anything significant no, I've just been playing video games, rapping presents, and talking to Madison, and hanging out. And yeah, it's been low key. How's your week been? Uh, busy, fun. So, I think I told you last week that I got my Xbox Series X. Mm-hmm. Um, on Congrats on that. There you go. So, I, don't know, I haven't even paid a dime towards it yet, so you know, there's that. Uh, but... One of the big reasons that I wanted to get it because was because like I have been dying to play Baldur's Gate 3. But then I ran into another issue. So we're going to talk about it in a little bit here. But as, as you heard, we kind of flub it in the beginning of the show. Um, at the Game Awards, it was, and I'm using quotation figures, announced that that evening, Baldur's Gate 3 was available on the Xbox Series X. Or on Xbox because they're trying to slowly phase out the xbox one but um uh i and i went shit like i'm not gonna have money until the 20th like how am i gonna get this game this fucking sucks so i start calling around saturday no saturday i'm sorry this was thursday night so friday i start calling around i start calling a couple places in town that do trade seeing how much they can get for cash or if they can do store credit but give me you know gift cards turned out my best option oddly enough was gamestop I was going to say. Um, and I say, you know, for anyone curious why I'm saying oddly enough is because you usually GameStop isn't known for fair trade deals. But like the two other stores in town, they were even worse. GameStop was giving me $70 store credit on the system. Whereas like this other location was giving me 50 store credit and like $35 cash. And another location was giving me, um, I think it was like $55 cash and like 50 store credit. So I was like, all right, GameStop, here we go. The problem was I still wasn't sure if I could get uh, gift cards. Well, I was like, well, 70 is also not going to cut it because I need, they do, the, uh, Xbox, the high, the lowest they have is $25 gift cards. Yeah. 
It's like 25, 50, 100 is like their, their denominator. Whereas like Nintendo's like 10, 20, 50. <laughs> um, but uh, I was like, well, I do have this two terabyte Seagate expansion drive for the Xbox One. Um, I'll need to eventually get one for the Series X, but we'll cross the bridge when we get there. Um I think a terabyte will work because I don't play a ton of games at a time and I can delete quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but, um, so I go to GameStop with the, the system in that, in that drive and the guy was like, 80 bucks. It's like, perfect. Get me uh, three of those $25 gift cards, please. And thank you. Um, and it worked. It went through. And so I was able to get Baldur's Gate that night. It was Friday night. But the two friends I play game night with on every Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday if something's going on, um, they had they they were gonna buy it, and I was like, "Fuck, I gotta I gotta download this." That's why I did that so quickly. But because we play Tuesday night, we all agreed we wouldn't do anything with the game until Tuesday. So the whole fucking weekend, I couldn't play the goddamn game, and it was killing me. Uh that being said, I we did when we did like, it's it's been a blast. It's been an absolute blast. Like that game is addicting. You're just constantly like, "Hey, I started playing three hours ago, and I didn't even realize three hours passed." Yeah. And, um, like it a hundred percent is understandable why it won Game of the Year. Because the other the other aspect is that like we'll play for three hours and we, we're like oh we did a bunch and then we realize that we've done fucking nothing compared to the actual size of the game. Yeah, like it's insane. It's fucking insane. But I'm happy that I got it. I had been playing it. I played it last night again, but I was way the fuck too late because the past couple days have been like so. Tuesday nights our game night. We stayed up until I stayed up until two. They stayed up until midnight. But you know Mark has to get up at like fucking five in the morning, so he was hurting worse than us. Well, um, midnight, you know, for them is two for you anyway. Well, that's what I'm saying is they stayed. Up oh, until, okay. Yeah, they stayed up until midnight. Where Andy has to get up at six to take his kids to school, and Mark has to get up at like five to go to work. So gotcha. I was running off of five hours of sleep. Um, because I had to get up at seven to get take my dad to a dialysis appointment. And my brother decided that, like, I guess his new job, the one he has, is uh, every three months or so or something like that, he has to take a day off in the middle of the week. I don't know the law or what the reason is. He, that's just that's just something he has to do. So he decided to take the 13th off. And he was like, hey, on the 13th, I'm going to take that day off and we're going to get your fucking car registered. And I'm like, okay. Hey, by the way, my dad has a dialysis appointment and an eye doctor appointment. <laughs> He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, dude. So did all of that, got home around, I want to say 4.30. And I'm like, I'm exhausted, but I'm like, well, I still want to get the car cleaned up and get the new license plate on. So I did all of that and uh, I come inside and I'm like, I'm dead ass tired, but I'm, I'm keeping awake because I know that if I stay awake longer, I'll get some more sleep. Yeah. 11 o'clock rolls around. I'm like, I can't do it any longer. I got to go to bed. So I take a couple of my uh, melatonin pills and I lay down and Andy texts me a little bit after he goes, video games? I'm like, God damn it. Yeah, I'll play. And I'm thinking, we'll play a little Overwatch, right? Like, we're not going to play Baldur's Gate because we have the other campaign going. And he goes, I have a proposition for you. And I'm like, what? And he goes, why don't you and I start our own campaign um, and we'll we'll just kind of be dicks. Like, we'll be assholes in the game. And I was like, what, like a uh, sort of chaotic neutral? And he goes, yes. I'm like, uh, all right. <laughs> Here we go, and uh, so we made we made so we made orcs half orcs. Uh, we told ourselves that we're brothers, but the game doesn't give a shit about that. They're like, cool, all right. Anyway, because um, the campaign is designed for one player, it's designed as a single player game. Yeah, but if you play with friends, it's like all of you are the one character. If that makes sense. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Because you can have individual conversations and you can have individual storylines and individual uh, uh, romance options and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, <laughs> all right, uh, the story is designed for. 
You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. It's just my desktop speaker that sits next to my monitor. Just got knocked off by a cat nonchalantly. Uh, oh, cats. Causing all sorts of chaos if they can. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and then and then last night, it happened again. Like, we stayed up until uh, 2 mm-hmm. o'clock for me, midnight for him. Because, again, we were just fucking, like, lost in the sauce. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a dangerous game. Like, and I, I mean that in the context of it'll eat your goddamn time. It is a time vampire of a game. I love a game like that. I mean, that I do you too, just but... fire up, and then the next thing you know, two or three hours have gone by, and you have no idea why. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, but. The other thing is that, again, like I said, Thursday, you know, the Game Awards happened. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about that. So I sent you some uh, reviews. Oh, not reviews. Uh, I'm sorry. Trailers. I sent you some trailers. Did you have a chance to watch those? I did not get the chance to watch those because you sent them after I had gone to sleep last night. And then this morning, I was like, oh, I'll watch that in a few minutes. And then I fired up YouTube and dozed off for a couple hours. Well, then. Um it's all right. Uh, you can watch them later, but I will talk about them briefly. Um, so, Baldur's Gate 3 won Game of the Year. And the funniest thing that's come from that to me is that a bunch of Spider-Man 2 fans are losing their fucking minds on social media. They're all very much like, how did a game like this and then show the most like dull t- 10 seconds of a video game you've ever fucking seen went out over this and then show combat in, in Spider-Man. I'm like, that's not even a fair comparison in any regard. No, no. Um, you know, two of the biggest factors that you have to put into play with those two games is that uh, Larian is borderline a fucking independent studio. Um, and they were able to put in like 3,000 pages or more or something like that. I think 3,000 3, pages per character. Or some shit like that. Like it was insane. And you talk to the voice actors for the game and they're just like, oh yeah, our scripts were massive. And it's like, yeah, when you when you have a game that gives the player so much fucking freedom, you have to have dialogue ready for each and every fucking encounter. Well, plus it took six years to develop the game. Right. Versus, you know, Spider Man two what was it? Miles Morales came out two years ago. Yeah. Uh, and so then yeah, the, is, the, the, the Spider-Man game before that came out the year prior, maybe, th- maybe four years ago, but regardless, this is a third game in this line from an insomniac. They didn't have the same development time. Uh, it's a smaller game. It doesn't have the scope. I mean, yes, it's a big game. It's in. It's set in, you know, uh, New York City, and encompasses, you know, all of Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, you know. Uh, but but but. You're not traversing countrysides. You're traversing city blocks. You know, there's a different mode of travel, transportation, just the scope beyond everything. And you can't interact, you know, beyond the crude interaction of, oh, yeah, you can press triangle and take a high, you know, take a selfie and high five a guy on a fucking sidewalk. But you don't have endless dialogue that you're choosing from and has outcomes on what's going on in the world around you. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's my thing about like, there's nothing wrong with Spider-Man two. It is a great fucking game. It deserves its high marks, but let's say, let's say Baldur's Gate was didn't even come out this year. Right. And it was going up against the other games in that category. It's still lost to Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. Like, people have to understand that, yes, was it a great game? Yes. Could it have beaten, like, it wasn't going to beat fucking Alan Wake 2. 
Like, we have to be real here. <laughs> it was nominated for Game of the Year because it's a great game. But yeah. It was not Game of the Year. And it no. shouldn't be on anybody's list. I loved it very, very much. You know, I played through it several several times. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, once you do everything, the replay value is not there. Um, right. and you can still replay it, but it's that's a you can still, yeah, you can still play it, but there's just you know, it's like, oh, well, there's not a new game plus setting, and you don't get to do all the things that you can do in other games. Uh, once you finish the main campaign, it's just you can continue on in the city and rack up and collect a few collectibles and things like that, but there's not much else to do. That's not. <laughs> Pardon me. That's not detracting from the incredible story that it tells. And it does tell an incredible story. And it's very fun gameplay. But other games that I played this year that I enjoyed more than it, Star Wars Jedi Survivor was phenomenal. You know, and it came out a good six months earlier, but I enjoyed it more and it had more replay value. Uh, you know, then there was Indie Game of the Year, Sea of Stars, which was phenomenal. Uh, I loved it, and I played the hell out of that game. But, you know, I would choose either one of them over Spider-Man 2 for the Game of the Year, and I didn't even play Tears of the Kingdom or Alan Wake 2 or Baldur's Gate 3. You know, that's just a personal preference. But I realize why when you give somebody game of the year and awards don't mean anything, but so it contradicts what I'm getting ready to say, you know, it's not to be taken lightly, you know, it's a, well, it's, also, it's a significant recognition. Yes. Uh, well, it's a significant recognition because, because society gives it that recognition. I think that's something that you have to kind of put into play when talking about it too, because Yes. Do the awards really mean anything? No. The, the, the studios and the people involved, like, so if you take the Oscars or the Emmys or the Tonys versus the Game Awards, um, the biggest difference between those is where the money is coming from and going. So mm-hmm. in those other ones, other than the Game Awards, a lot of the time you will have movies or TV shows or music or, 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 uh, or plays that are specifically designed to win awards. Now, why does that happen? Because there needs to be award bait for the sake of making money. You have to. And that's what the Oscars are for. Like, you're going to see a lot of award bait movies in there that didn't do well in the box office, but it's going to make them a lot of money because people are going to tune in every fucking year. Um like the player, not player, but the uh, the viewers choice awards or whatever, I think are way more important because that's, you know, we get to vote on that. Um, the game awards don't do that. Does it still make, is it still there to make money? Yes. Now, because it's, it's an award show and they have to make money, it's less so due to the fact that the industry itself is still pretty young compared to the other ones. And even though it makes more significantly much more money than the entertainment industry of Hollywood. Absolutely. Uh, but because it's, it's, it's smaller. A lot of the people that are involved with it have investment into it. Aren't like the people with the investment with the movie studios, the music industry and, and, and Broadway. Um, I mean, scumbags. <laughs> so that's kind of, kind of like something that I love about, why to me the game awards are a little bit more important but at the end of the day it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter no Um, because and this is something i've been pointing out to people for years the reason the game awards exist at all is to show off trailers or announcements like that's it jeff Keeley has two events that happen every year he has uh summer games or what the fuck ever it's called i don't remember the total title but there's that one, um, and uh, and then this, the Game Awards. And those two events show off a shit ton of trailers, announce a bunch of shit. It's an event. 
It's just an event to get you hyped for the next fucking game. Yeah. Nothing really wrong with it um, in that regard. Uh, but people like argued like, oh, the point of it is to have awards. No. Because they did the math and 18% of the entire Game Awards three-hour event was awards. was actual awards. 18%. The rest was trailers. So, come at me again with it's not for trailers and I have the fucking stats to back it up. Um, that being said, there were quite a few trailers that I got it. Like, I was like, oh, that game looks interesting. Uh, one being Usual Jane, which looks like it's just kind of a um, hack and slash sort of game, but to the backdrop of like a young girl's, you know, coming into womanhood sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Harmonium, which is a rhythm game from the perspective of a deaf girl. I thought that was unique. I was like, I want to check that out. Uh, Windblown, which is an isometric hack and slash. It kind of reminded me of Hades a little bit. Yeah. Because it looks like it's going to be uh, um, uh, it looks like it's going to be uh, uh Oh my god, a roguelite? Jesus Christ. But it's a multiplayer roguelite. You can get huh. three players, it looks like. Yeah, so that it looked like it kind of it kind of surprised me because the trailer starts off as like a cartoonish thing and then gets real fucking viscerally dark. I was like, I like that juxtaposition. Like the, the cartoon characters are getting like sliced in half. So blood and whatnot. Yeah, it's crazy. Um there's Exodus, which was a game that I guess somehow stars Matthew McConaughey because he came and announced it. All but, right. Yeah, it looks like uh, they got Matthew McConaughey because he was in, um, oh, why can't I think of the name of that movie? Uh, the space one that he was in. The Interstellar? Interstellar, thank you. Yeah, it looks like because it, like, essentially, like, the main character you play, um, they're being attacked by some alien race. He sends her on a ship away from the black hole that they're going towards. No, not a black hole. I'm sorry, a, a, a light speed gate, or yeah, speed speed of light gate, or something like that. And him and the aliens go through it. When he comes out the other side, he finds out that his daughter is like old because of the time dilation. So I was like, "Cool, I'll check it out. It looks neat." Uh, Visions of Mana. One of the games I think you'd be more interested in. Yeah, I saw something about that. Looked interesting. I mean, I, I, I assume you like the Of Mana series. Yes, no? Okay. Um, Sorry, uh, Misty is getting ready to go get Madison, and she was telling me bye. Um, <clears throat> but, but, yeah, it's... Uh, I've seen a little bit about it, but not much. Uh, well, the, the, I mean, that's the tra- there's only the trailer that they've shown, so that's... I haven't watched it yet. I just saw an article about it saying that it was in the spirit of the Legends of Mana and Secret of Mana. Yeah, I was, that's what I was asking, is how much of the Mana series have you played? I have them, not played them. Gotcha. Okay, well... Um, they're action RPGs, is what they are. They've been action RPGs since the start, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Rise of the Ronin looks really interesting. I can't, it's an action game, and it's, you know, you play as a Ronin uh, during uh, Feudal Japan, but I don't, I don't know more than that. But it looks cool, so we'll see. Um, there was a moment, now, in that trailer thing I gave you, it's like eight minutes long, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. It shows the quote-unquote trailer. It's more of a teaser. The actor and actress that are going to be in it. Um, What I'm assuming it is, it is a horror game similar to Silent Hill. Because Kojima's making it. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever played the Silent Hill games, but... Never. What what was interesting was they show that trailer, and then Hideo Kojima comes out and talks, talks to Jeff with a translator... Um, and, uh, and then they announced the collaboration that Hideo Kojima has for this, for this game. And it's Jordan Peele. Oh. So I was like, I'm even more interested now. 
But uh, but yeah, it's called OD so far. We, I mean, it's probably that's probably a code name for it. But um, there's a game called The Last Sentinel coming out that looks really interesting. It's uh, the story from what I can tell is that it's in the future and there are these people that protect society called Sentinels and something bad happens and you're the last one. That's that's the best I got, but. Um, the gameplay looked fun. Uh, the last trailer that I was surprised by is uh, they're making a Blade video game, Marvel's Blade. Yeah, I've seen the trailer for that. Okay, so uh, that's in that lineup that I showed you. But yeah, I was doing. Like, Misty what? showed it to me. We got Wolverine and Blade coming out. I just hope it's good. Uh, Blade is made by the same studio that did. Um, the uh, uh oh my god why can't i remember the name of that game studio that made blade i mean it's a bethesda it's a bethesda studio uh that made it's making that making blade arcane arcane studios is what it is and they made the um oh, jesus christ it doesn't tell me here arcane studios It's driving me nuts. Death Loop and Dishonored. Okay. And those games are really good. The, the only one that they've made recently that's bad, but it's not their fault, is Redfall. So. I have faith that they'll do a good job with it, but we'll see. Uh, the last thing I want to mention about the Game Awards, uh, before I get to some of the awards that happened with it, um, Last year, uh, because of God of War 2, uh, Christopher Judge won uh, Best Performance uh, with, by playing Kratos. And uh, he had a 10-minute acceptance speech. Because of him, they wanted to make those acceptance speeches much less. The problem was... <laughs> Is that, and I don't get why they did this, but they basically said, if you're going to do that, oh, sorry, oh, I came out of nowhere, uh, we're going to cut down to 30 second acceptance speeches. Ugh. So when, um, when uh, Game of the Year, when Larian Studios was up on stage ex- giving their acceptance, they ran out of time and were not able to announce that it, that it was available on Xbox. Mm. so that's why I say like announced it was on Xbox that night they were supposed to say it on stage but they ran out of time because again 30 seconds yeah that's bullshit even Jeff came out and was like that's way too short but I don't know how much control he had in that so I don't know um, obviously not much not much it was crazy. But yeah, Jeff, uh, not Jeff, but uh, Christopher Judge had a great joke on stage too because he was like, um, my speech last year was longer than the current Call of Duty campaign, which is literally like two hours long, I think, or something like that. Jesus. I was like, that's a hell of a dig. Apparently it was such a dig that it pissed off uh, de- developers from uh, Call of Duty. Like, well, well, I mean, together. I don't have to tell you. Yeah, if they're really that pissed about it, then maybe they'll fucking give some actual campaigns that people can sink their teeth into instead of focusing on online play. Exactly. So, um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and run down. Is the main reason why I don't buy Call of Duty games and never played them is because I know they don't have campaigns for shit. Uh, that's, that's hit or miss. Like, Modern Warfare 2 is still easily one of the best campaigns. I'm sorry, Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare is easily one of the best campaigns. Modern Warfare 2 is a close second. Um, and then after that, it was like really hit and miss until Black Ops, the first Black Ops was really good. And then it just kind of went downhill from there. Uh, they tried to do a Cold War one. They even tried to go back to World War One, but it just, not World War I, but World War Two. It just didn't really work. Um, and then they did one that I thought was really fucking interesting, and that was a spa- that was a future war where you're like in space for parts of it with like zero grav. And it was a fun campaign. It was really cool and creative. And the gamers went, "Ah, it fucking sucks." And I was like, "Cool, we're never getting that again, then." Yeah. 
And ever since then, it's just been garbage campaigns. But um, so uh, I'm going to go over some of the awards that happened, uh, who won them. I'm not going to go over all the nominees, just who won. So for best action adventure, it was uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, best action game was Armored Core 6. Best family game went to Mario, uh, Super Mario Wonder. Best fighting game was uh, Street Fighter 6, which pissed off a lot of people because they thought that Mortal Kombat 1 should have won, but whatever. Uh, best RPG was Baldur's Gate 3. Um, innovation and accessibility went to Forza because you could basically have the, the game play itself. I'm not kidding. Like, very little control. Yeah, maybe they should uh, give some uh, give some pointers to Tesla. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, let's see. Uh, best community support went to Baldur's Gate 3. And this is because Larian knows that the problems are with their game and will work to fix them as quickly as can and explain what they're doing to fans through the forums. Uh, best debut indie game went to Cocoon which I've played that because it's on Game Pass and it is fun. Best indie game went to Sea of Stars, which is exactly what I told you last week, was that that was going to win Best Indie Game because it is. Yeah. Um, Best ongoing game went to Cyberpunk 2077 because mainly of the uh, Phantom Liberty DLC. Yeah. Uh, Best performance went to Neil Nubon for Asterion and Baldur's Gate 3. Best audio design went to Hi-Fi Rush. Uh, best score to Final Fantasy 16. Uh, best art direction was Alan Wake 2. Best narrative was Alan Wake 2. And best game direction was Alan Wake 2. Which I need to watch that game because there ain't no way I'm going to be able to fucking play it. Um, I don't do horror games. I can watch them. I can't play them. Uh, and then Game of the Year went to Baldur's Gate 3. So it was like Baldur's Gate 3 and Alan Wake 2 like won the most. But it's funny because everything that was in the nominee for Game of the Year won an award, except for Spider-Man 2. <laughs> that sucks. I mean, sure. I mean, it does suck, but at the same time, okay. It wasn't going to listen. It wasn't going to beat fucking uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom for best action game. No. Um. It, let's see. What else did it? What, what else was that up for? Uh, it wasn't going to beat fucking innovation accessibility versus Forza. Good lord, Forza! Like Forza's fucking accessibility options are unmatched. Um, it wasn't going to beat audio design against Hi-Fi Rush. That entire game is based on audio design. Uh, like people are mad that um, the guy who voiced uh, Spider-Man or Peter Parker. Uh, I can't think of his name. Yuri Lowenthal. People are mad that he didn't win best performance. But like that's the problem with, with Yuri. I love Yuri, but Yuri doesn't have a shit ton of range. Neil Nubon does. Like his his range is insane. Um in Resident Evil Village, he plays one of the bad guys you fight named Heisenberg. If you listen to Heisenberg and Asterian back to back, you would never guess it was the same voice actor. Never. Hmm. They sound Polar opposite. Uh, it was up for best score. I haven't listened to Final Fantasy 16 score, so I couldn't tell you if it was better than Spider-Man's, but uh, it wasn't going to win best art direction against Alan Wake 2. It was not going to win best narrative. I'm sorry. That game is great. I have nothing against it. But the, the, the narrative in Alan Wake 2 and Baldur's Gate easily better than Spider-Man. And best game direction. Like, there's a reason that Alan Wake 2 won best game direction. So, I'm just saying, like, it was a rough year. Like, this year was stacked. Yeah, it really was. So. Um, all right, well, we're done with talking about that. Uh, so I have a topic discussion before we get to the Doctor Who review. Goddamn cat. <laughs> cat is a menace. Um, so I, I was watching a few things recently, and I got to thinking, and it was, a very, it was a very strange concept to me, but 
have you ever noticed how Star Wars gets a lot more ire from fans than Star Trek? Yet Star well, Trek has more content. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Like, is it is because it one Star caters Trek? to a broader mass than the next, even though they both are. Uh, well, there's. I think there's more appeal, mass mass appeal, for one over the other. And because I think I was, as a result, you're going to get more ire from the fanboys. That's yeah. That's kind of where my mind was in regards to that was. Um, it, it's like Star Wars has always been kind of easy sci-fi. Like, you know, let's say, you know, if you go fantasy, Lord of the Rings is high fantasy, Mm -hmm. essentially, whereas, like, Harry Potter is easy fantasy or soft fantasy. Does that make sense? I get what you're saying. And I feel like that's the same with, with Star Wars and Star Trek. It's just so interesting to me. They're both, like, high fucking... um high sci-fi or not high sci-fi very popular sci-fi you just you never see a ton of anger directed at star trek you do you see it but it's like it's so quiet and not that like big of a deal i don't know it just caught my eye i was like Star 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 Wars does not have nearly as much content as Star Trek, you know. There's hours and hours and hours of Star Trek, but the fans just kind of accept the bad and go with it. Whereas with Star Wars, it's like one bad movie ruins the whole fucking franchise. It's the same thing with fucking Marvel right now. It's like one bad movie, suddenly the franchise is dead. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. But uh, no, no, I just wanted to bring that up because I was like, I'm kind of curious as to why, and I think you nailed it. It's, it's there's a different type of fan base. Well, you know, when you have a larger cross section of uh, fans, you're going to have more broad opinions, and then, I mean, today's society, people latch on to what they fucking hear. You know, they want they th- that cognitive bias. They something that they hear that backs up what they think already, and they just repeat it instead of looking into it. It's, people suck. People just fucking suck. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, yeah, but people not- collectively, a mob mentality. I don't mean individuals. Well, yeah, it's, it you know goes back to that line from from uh, the first Men in Black movie. It's like a person is rat- rational and and calm. Uh, people are panicky and and disorderly, or whatever the fuck he said. I'm sure I'm getting that quote wrong, but whatever. I get the gist of what it's supposed to mean, though. People are definitely dangerous. Yeah, I just you know I I would like to because like. There are two Star Trek shows that are immensely fucking well received and very good. I enjoy both quite a bit. That's uh, um, Lower Decks and Strange New Worlds. Great fucking shows. And uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I lost my train of thought there. Uh, It's just, it's, I don't know. I just find it interesting that you have two of the biggest fucking sci-fi franchises in the world and it's like, it's like even like uh, Doctor Who, you know, like take this last Doctor, the, the um, 13th. 14th. Of, uh, oh, the 13th. Like, talking about Jody Whittaker. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you said fuck something. I didn't quite hear you, and then you went. No. Oh, okay. 
No, I, I was I was trying to say 14th, and I was like, wait a minute, you mean Jody Whitaker? You're not talking about the current slide, the most current tenant. No, I'm talking about yeah, because tenant's 10th and 10 and 14. Uh, Jody's 13. But the reason I bring up Jody is because like something that I've been seeing a lot with the um, since these specials is people being like, oh man, Davies is back, so everything's gonna be better. Because the last guy was terrible, and I'm like, okay, well, that's an opinion. I don't, you know, I don't like that kind of terminology or wording, but whatever. But it's like when that's even being discussed, there are a bunch of people that do not like her run, and not because of her, but because of the writing. And they'll make that clear. They go, yeah, this is writing wasn't for me, you know, it is what it is. But uh, you know, I'm excited for the new stuff. Like that's. That's what I want to see more out of fans. And you just don't fucking get that from Star Wars fans. It's crazy. No. But, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I kind of noticed it and I was like, I don't want to bring that up to my head. Uh, well, with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and talk about Doctor Who, shall we? Oh, no, I'm not prepared. Well, you should have gotten prepared. <laughs> no, uh, is it? We- we did a soft reboot with the with the show, and uh, we're gonna you know got new art. We're gonna have we have the new intro, I have, and I was uh, actually just fucking around with the new art in the background. <laughs> but there are some things that don't change. Like I can't read my own fucking script. No, and Maya's not prepared. No, I'm pulling it up now. The recap of the anniversary special. Uh. God damn, where's Wikipedia? It's not on your computer at the moment. No, it's, it's, not. it's out there. Something I found out about Texas uh, yesterday getting my uh, uh, license plates is that you have to have a front license plate or you can face up a two, a t- up to a $200 fine. That's the same in Virginia. Uh, the California did not give a shit. Same as in Virginia. All right, the giggle. Uh, it opens up in 1925 Soho, and you see an assistant to, to, to the television inventor, John Logie Baird, making a purchase at a toy shop owned by the toy maker, sporting a heavy, obviously fake German accent. Uh, in the present day, the toy maker causes havoc around the world and faces off against the Doctor and Donna. Playing a second game against him, the Doctor loses, but they agree for a third match to end the draw. The Doctor and Donna go to unit, reuniting to Kate, reuniting with Kate Lethbridge Stewart and Melanie Bush, and together they discover that the toy maker has been using a hidden laughing sound in all screens since the advent of television. The toy maker shows up and saps the doctor with a galvanic beam, causing him to bi-generate, allowing the 14th and the 15th doctors to coexist. The two doctors defeat the toy maker in a game of catch and banish him from existence as he threatens his legion's arrival, and a mysterious woman takes his golden tooth that is imprisoning the master. Before departing in his TARDIS, the new doctor creates one for his predecessor who decides to settle down on Earth with Donna and her family. Gross oversimplification. Eh, you know, it works because now we get to talk about the details. Yeah, yeah. Right off the bat, like, I've never watched, like, I've watched the scenes that they posted on YouTube, but, I, you know, I never watched the original Seven Doctors. So I had never seen the Toy Maker episode. Yeah. Um, did I get a quick briefing of it on YouTube? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, knowing what kind of character he is, having Neil Patrick Harris play them was so fucking fun. Like, yeah, he, he did a tremendous job in the role. Yeah, it was... Um, I've um, watched that scene over again where he's in the unit headquarters to uh, Spice Girls. Oh, Such yeah. Fucking scene. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. It's chaotic as fuck. Uh, just as an FYI, let's keep talking, but you're going to hear some noises in the background. 
That's fine. That's fine. So, you know, this this episode really did a lot to kind of reset. I wouldn't say retcon, but kind of reset some of the things from Jody Whitaker's run that when Chris Chibnall was showrunner. Uh, most importantly, the Timeless Children, they the whole Timeless Child storyline, they seem to kind of, with just the effect of one line from the toy maker, make it not as important as, you know, it really was, which a lot of people were happy about that. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, if you're the familiar flux. with it at all. No, not the Flux, the Timeless Child. Because you haven't watched of, it yet. I was like, yeah, if that's part of Jody Whitaker's one, I have not watched that yet. That's literally the only thing of Doctor Who I haven't watched yet. Okay. Like any of that. So it's like, I got fully caught up with Capaldi's run, which had a very bittersweet ending. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I watched him regenerate into Jody Whitaker and then fall out of the TARDIS. That's it. That's all I know. Yeah. Yeah. Once you but, get caught up, well, that's, you know, what you were talking about. That's something I've always loved about Doctor Who since I started watching it was there are a certain set of rules, but none of them need to be hard set. You know, none of them ha- like they can be adjusted. They can be changed. One of the reasons that regeneration even exists is because William Hartwell was literally his health was declining. He was becoming harder and harder to work with and they needed him off the show. That was the agreement was to allow yeah. the show to continue because it was really fucking popular at the time was have the doctor since he's been established as an alien turn into a different actor um like a lot of the show uh Christopher Eccleston was apparently supposed to run for like three fucking seasons and he hated working on that show so yeah. halfway through halfway through season 1 they wrote him into being regenerated at the end of his season yep like that show, like Doctor Who constantly changes for whatever the world needs to be. There's one to me hard set rule that cannot change with Doctor Who ever. And that's the doctor must have loads of empathy. Can he be a little bit of a dick? Yes. But his empathy still is the forefront to his actions. Yeah, yeah, and that's not really a you know rule. Uh, but it should be. I mean, it's not but a rule one of the, the writing of the show, but that's, that's how I Yeah, understand. one of the rules of the writing of the show was there was a limited number of regenerations. And 10 years ago, they were out of those regenerations with Matt Smith, and they're like, fuck, we need to go to Capaldi. We don't have any more regenerations. They wrote it in. They wrote a way in for the that's regeneration right. cycle to reset. That's exactly what I'm saying, is that you can do whatever the fuck you want with Doctor Who. And nobody cared then. Uh, look. <laughs> well, s- some people did, but, you know. I mean, one of my favorite things about sci-fi is the freedom to kind of go wherever you want. Same with fantasy. But there are people that are like, well, you established this rule in the first episode, and it's like, well, if they fucking wrote it, or they're the writers, guess what they can do? Anything. Mm-hmm. Fucking anything. But, but no, it was, uh, going back to the show, it was really fun, you know, how Donna, you know, ends up being so important and can do so many things that Kate Lethbridge Stewart offers her a job with unit. And she's like, well, what's the pay? She's like 60,000 pounds a year and, you know, Oh, two she weeks makes- off, and she's like, "How about one hundred and twenty thousand and five weeks off?" And she's like, "Done." <laughs> so essentially, if we want future Donna, they can do future Donna. They can have her work at Unit, and she can still be a part of the show. Yeah, I mean, they've had if she chooses. Well, like this episode had what I think the fifth Doctor's companion, fifth slash six. Yeah, I don't remember her name, but I don't Melanie Bush. Yeah. 
that's the thing. I I never watched Doctor Who prior to it coming back in like the two, the early two thousands or mid two thousands or whatever. So like every time they're like, "Hey, here's K nine," I'd be like, "What the fuck is K nine?" Yeah. But you know, going back and like kind of watching moments of old Doctor Who and whatnot, I've learned to really fucking like appreciate it. I oh yeah. Like, like so as 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 we talked about earlier, I've been watching, I've been catching up with Doctor Who, and in that last special with um Capaldi's run, um is the first doctor played by uh David Bradley. Yes, yes, yeah. David Bradley. And uh, he nails it first and foremost. But what's really fucking funny to me is that his run was in the 60s. And in the 60s, you know, misogyny was a thing. Was it as bad as, you know, go, you know, even pa- your further past? No. But um, uh, what made it really funny to me was he would say very misogynistic shit. And it was just fine. Even then. And so they kind of played around with that a bit. And it was really fucking funny. Like talking about him making that joke about how women are uh, um, fragile. like mm-hmm. And Bill being like, are we? Are we now? <laughs> Shit was fucking, it's too fucking funny. But, uh, um, but that's my, the reason I bring that up is that's my favorite thing about the doctor is that as he regenerates and grows, he learns more. He's not just this character that a- a- accepts the world that he's in. He has growth. Period. Yes. I mean, even go to the past doctors. Like, as time progressed, you know, you got more into the 70s and the 80s, and the doctor was less of a misogynist. That's just because of how the fucking show is stru- structured like that. Um, so having that kind of play with the 13th or the 12th doctor and the first doctor, I was like, this is enjoyable as hell. Uh, but, um, you know, going into this, into these three episodes, you have three female characters, three women who are at the top of their fucking game. And then you bring in another companion to the doctor who's also at the top of her game. And it's 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 refreshing, you know. Oh, absolutely. Because there's that moment where the the toy maker has the the, the gun or the laser or whatever the fuck it was called. The galvanic he, beam. Galvanic beam, and he points it at each of the companions and says, "Like, who should I kill?" And like, kind of list them in 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 form. And I was like, "That's fucking awesome. That is goddamn awesome." And all all the doctor could do was be like, "Please don't fucking kill them. Point that thing at me." Like don't yeah them. threw himself in front of the path and he's like take me. That's all he could do. Now I do have a question. Yes. So in the episode, they constantly say that by generation is a myth, or they said I always heard it as a myth. Do you think that by generation only existed because it was the toy maker's domain? I or did. That... I, I did. I don't know. Because at the end of the episode, when. Uh, uh, Shooty, Shooty. Yeah, Shooty Gawa. Shooty, Shooty. I, I didn't know how to pronounce his name last week, and then I saw a tweet that actually spelled it phonetically. And it's 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 spelled N C U I T I, but it's pronounced Shooty. Yeah, Shooty. Yes, I I in my brain I couldn't remember if it was C H O O or S H O O on the pronunciation because I because I saw a pronunciation spelled out, and that helped me all. But my brother, I was I just could not remember it was C H or S H, but yeah, it's Shooty. Um, yeah, when Shooty when Shooty is in the TARDIS with uh, the Doctor, and they're talking about him retiring and all this kind of stuff, and actually getting relaxation. Um, there is a uh, he's like, oh, there might be some of his you know domain left, and he hits it with the mallet and makes a second TARDIS. My thought process was. Is that why he bi-generated? Because it was a myth, but because it was the Toymaker's domain, it became a bi-generation. I don't know how to answer that. 
Well, I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't have a theory. It ultimately doesn't matter. Um, it happened. Yeah. But I just was. I was like. I was interested because I was like, if it's a myth, were they able to? Like, did it happen because of that, or was it a situation where like the galvanic beam caused it, or was it like, hey, this is fourteenth to fifteenth, we're just going to have it happen? Like, it's it's kind of in the air. I like it like that. I like it a little bit ambiguous, but I'm sure there's others that have a, you know, that that thought has crossed their mind and. They have working theories on it. Uh, We ultimately may get answers in the show as a result. We may not. Uh, That's what's great about it being left up in the air, but it is something to think about. Now that, you know, I hadn't thought about it, to be honest. I've been watching a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, and they just, they literally uh, talked about how they thought it'd be a fun idea to um, to do that. They thought it would be a fun idea to have uh, Shooty and David in the same fucking scene, essentially. And that's why they chose to do it. But in all intents and purposes, like, uh, um, there's got to be an in-universe reason. Yeah, and yeah, I, Absolutely. They just never, they never explain it if it has to do with the Toymaker's Domain or if it's a galvanic theme. They never really say. They never say if it's just a, if it's just a Time Lord thing that they never knew about because no one's made it to 15 regenerations. Yeah. So, who the fuck knows? But it was fun. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, what, any final thoughts in a grade? I am excited about Shooty Gut was Doctor. Yeah, same here. Um, I found him in the time that we had him delightful, uh, very extremely charismatic, uh, border, you know, he's he's even got flamboyance about him, um, confidence, you know, just picking up on that in 10 minutes time. Uh, uh, I'm really excited to see where the story goes with him. Uh, you know, and I think it's also a nice thing that it's like, hey, he tells the doctor, you know, I'm okay now because you took time to take care of yourself. So take time to take care of yourself. And he settles down, you know, and he's like, how do I do that? How do I stay still in one place? How do I live day to day? You know, and the fact that he's getting to learn how to do so with Donna is you know, uh, as a member of the extended family, I thought that was awesome. I agree. <clears throat> what about you? I mean, what? Any uh, final thoughts on your end? I think, I think it was lovely that David Tennant came back for a short run. Um, you know, kind of set up. It set up this fun idea, like, I think all of us, especially Who fans, were trying to figure out why Tenet came back at all. Like, why the 14th Doctor looked like the 10th Doctor. Like, what was the reasoning behind it? And it was ultimately to finish, like, business that he had, essentially. Like, the whole thing with Donna. And... Like, it kind of felt like, you know, it put a sense of fate, uh, destiny, if you will, on the Doctor. And, you know, I think that at the end of the day, when it comes to who the Doctor is and what he does, it's sacrifice. It's constant, constant, constant sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. And he never has time for himself. Or at least if he does, it's short, short-lived. Um, and uh, it was nice that the, like, yes, thank you, Christopher Eccleston, for, for, for playing the Doctor and starting off this 
second phase of the franchise. But it was really Tenet that, you know, sparked it. That lit the fire, I guess. I yeah. It was the spark that, that Tenet was the, Tenet was the fire. Because I've talked to tons of people who really like Doctor Who now, and it's Tenet. It's not Eccleston. You get a few Ecclestons here and there, but it's mostly Tenet. I really enjoyed Eccleston. Uh, oh, I too. enjoyed I enjoyed Eccleston more than I enjoyed Matt Smith. Uh, that's, that's an opinion. It is an opinion. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed Matt Smith's opinion uh, companions more than I did Matt Smith. I I get that you didn't like Clara, Clara but I really liked Amy. Really, really liked. No, that, that's what I'm saying. I enjoyed. Matt Smith's companions more than him. Like, I really loved Amy and Rory's story. Loved River Song. Didn't care for Clara. Um, but, you know, I didn't dislike Matt Smith. I just thought his companions were better than his character. His Fair. portrayal of the character. I mean, that's, again, I don't, like... One of the things about Doctor Who that's so difficult for, I guess, viewers in general, and I've learned to accept it, was when Eccles didn't change the mess or to, to, to uh, Tenet, I was very confused because I didn't know it was a thing for for Doctor for the Doctor to do. Yeah. And then by the time that that Tenet left and it became Matt Smith, I was almost angry. It was almost like I got a stepfather, and I was like, "Fuck you! How dare you try to try to fit in his shoes." It felt like that, and I slowly started to accept Matt Smith as the Doctor. But then you go, you know, you go to you go to Capaldi, and I got so used to Matt Smith that this new type of Doctor, I, it, it pushed me away. And I and I watched Capaldi over the past couple of years very slowly, and I started to appreciate him. And I got to the point in my life where I'm like. If you're going to be a Doctor Who fan, you have to accept the next regeneration. You have to. Yeah. Because that's, that's how the show survives. That's how it lives on. And uh, if you want it to survive, if you want it to live on, it's like, well, I'm never, you know, if I like Star, Star Trek, I'm not going to suddenly be like, I'm not watching any show that doesn't have Picard. I'm not going to watch any show that doesn't have Janeway. That's stupid. Like, yeah, you like that captain. But that captain belonged to that show. That's kind yeah. of the same thing with Doctor Who here. There's always going to be a new captain. There's always going to be a new version. And, and new crew members. And if you love the franchise, you, you kind of have to accept that. Sure, can stories be written poorly? Absolutely. That's a whole other can of worms. But Doctor Who survives and dies by its regeneration. And maybe not dies, but it survives in whatever. It survives by its regeneration. So yeah. when like now I'm excited to watch uh, uh Whitaker. I'm excited to watch her run. I'm excited to watch God was run. So it's 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 interesting. It's Whitaker's run know. was unfairly criticized just because as you're aware of it being a woman. Yes, 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 yes. But she was a lot of fun. She brought a lot of heartedness and heart to the role. I don't agree with some of the writing choices that Chris Chibnall made. And apparently uh, Russell T Davies felt the same, uh, but a lot of fans were angry at some of the choices that he made, but some of the choices that he made, were brilliant to keep the show moving along. Uh, I think you'll really love this version of the master uh, when you get to him. Yeah. <clears throat> but, Missy was great. Missy was fucking oh, fantastic. So. Missy's hard to top. And this guy doesn't top Missy to me, but he was pretty great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I'll get to Well, ugh. I don't know how soon I'll get to it because of, you know, two other things <clears throat> next week. But anyway. Well, uh, there's there's eight episodes. I think eight, maybe ten episodes in the first two seasons of her run. But there's only like six episodes in her final run plus three specials. 
But everything is on HBO Max. Yes, 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 yes. I, I double checked. I double everything with her is, is on there. Yep. Um, all the specials, all the episodes, everything. The only thing that's not on there are these three specials that are on Disney Plus, which I'm not 100 percent sure why they're on Disney Plus and not Max. But um, yeah, that's actually something I was going to look into after we got done recording. Where are we going to watch the new show Christmas Day? It'll be on Max. Oh, it I know, will. I know that for a fact. It's the new season that I'm concerned about. Yeah. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I'm sorry. The Christmas special will be on Disney Plus. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. I said that totally wrong. I get what you're saying though. But will the new season be on Max? Like what what is BBC up to? I mean, I think I have BBC America, so it doesn't matter. But you know, for those people that don't what the fuck? We'll figure it out. And we'll talk about because we're going to review that season. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, oh shit. Oh, because, hey, if you've not figured out by now, we're Doctor Who fans. I'm glad I got, like, it's really funny, too, because when Eccleston's run was going on, we didn't have a way to watch it other than pirating straight up. And then uh, season two of this, like, or series two, I should say, with, with, uh, Tenet, Tenet was also pirated, but then BBC America came to our cable program uh, plan. And then we were able to watch series three, four and four and on, which is how my mom, I got my mom into it. Cause I was like, Hey, I have every episode on this flash drive. I never watched an episode of Dr. Who until after the 50th anniversary, 10 years ago aired. Wow. I never saw an episode. So of course I started with I started with uh, Eccleston. I remember when it came and, back and people were like, Oh my god, Doctor Who was back after that terrible fucking movie in the nineties. Which I've like, never they, seen. I s I don't care to. Um there is a short film that shows um eight regenerating into the war doctor. Yes, Have I've you seen, seen that? that. I've seen okay. That. Um, yeah, there's a connective tissue between each and every doctor now. Because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you can actually see the war doctor regenerating to Eccleston. Yes. Or like... At the end of the 50th anniversary special, I think it was. Yes, 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 yes. So, <clears throat> but uh, Even though Eccleston didn't actually film the part. No, it was, yeah, it was a, that's what I'm saying is it was like through a fuzzy mirror and you're like, oh, that's clearly Eccleston now. It's always interesting too, because like I, I, did, I recently found out Eccleston has zero desire to ever come back to the show as long as certain people are still working there. Found that out very recently. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I fucking love that. I'm excited for more. I'm going to give the whole, like this episode because Honestly, like, it really, really delves into the character of the Doctor and his past. All three of them do. Um, more recent past, uh, like, very fucking distant past, and then somewhat recent past. And, like, the Doctor is not infallible. He's just not. He makes mistakes. He's wrong all the fucking time. But he tries to correct it and tries to do his best that he can. And he has unbelievable amounts of empathy and that's what causes him to be such a fun character to watch and this special uh, exemplifies that so and then of course you have like in this in the last part of the special you have neil patrick harris just being a fun fucking villain to watch oh yeah i'm i love nph oh yeah same here i actually got mad at my dad a little while ago like when we were doing because uh, I had mentioned that this show was coming out or this movie was coming out with Neil Patrick Harris in it, or it was something. It was something that had to do with Neil Patrick. He's like, I'm not, I can't stand that guy. And I was like, how? Like, what did Neil Patrick Harris do for you to not like him? Like, the guy is fucking charismatic as hell. And he was like, oh, it's just like every time I see him, I just think of Barney from How I Met Your Mother. And I, Barney was awesome. And I go, so you didn't like the character of Barney, which fine, whatever that's taste has no, like nothing we can do with that. 
but you have this weird concept that that's who he plays all the time. Well, I know that's not who he plays, but every time I see Neil Patrick Harris, that's the character I think of, so I just get turned off whenever I see Neil Patrick Harris. Dad, that's got to be the dumbest thing you've ever said to me. Has he watched Harold and Kumar? Yes, he was, yes. He played himself. <laughs> played, a, played himself in the most exaggerated way, exaggerated way possible. Snorting fucking cocaine off of strippers' asses in a moving car? <laughs> but there's also one of my favorite things, and that was... Uh, um, uh, Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. Oh, yeah. I love Dr. Horrible. Oh, yeah. Same here. But, yeah. So, it was just like in one of the behind-the-scenes things for this, too. He was, taught, he was being interviewed on set. And he goes, so, yeah, Russell sends me the, the script. And I read through the whole thing. And I look at my husband. And I go, I have to go to Wales and do this thing. It's <laughs> 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 uh, so funny. But, um <clears throat> But yeah, A plus, A plus across the board, all three episodes. Yeah, are, yeah, too much fucking fun, phenomenal, a great, you know, nostalgia done well, uh, and not even nostalgia because essentially, technically, it's not ten, but it is ten. You know. Uh, but we got some great storytelling to come out of this, and I'm so excited for the future and what it holds. So, uh, but yeah, let's wrap this fucker up. Yep. Uh, so next week, guys, we're gonna be don't want to get it pregnant, huh? I said let's wrap this fucker up. We don't want to get it pregnant. Gotcha, boy. That that. The connective on that joke did not come through. I was like, well, I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. Um, uh, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. Next week, guys, we, uh, so a lot has happened this year. There's a lot of stuff we didn't get to watch. So we're going to review uh, season three of The Witcher, which was done in two different four-part episodes. Um, so it'll be eight episodes total that we're going to watch. Um, <laughs> For me to watch again. I <laughs> not watched it we also yeah, like I watched Black it Mirror three times uh but apparently maya likes it a lot so we'll see how i like it i'm a witcher fan what can i say that's true god is that ever true uh yeah so yeah witcher three next week um guys follow us on the socials listed below that's what you new that's where you'll find out when the new episodes are live uh if you want to support us directly go check out our teespring store they have a lot of merch over there and if you if you got to this part of the podcast, uh, use code um, AQU15 for a 15% discount on your order. It basically takes care of taxes. That's AQU15. Uh, Maya, where can folks find you? You can find me on Facebook under my name, Maya Dawn Fisher. It's a public profile. Uh, it's not linked to anything, but follow me. Send me a message. You know, let's talk TV shows, music, video games, anything. Um, However, uh, I did want to give a quick shout out to the company that handled uh, our new artwork, which you shall start to be seeing once we choose a background to layer it over, uh, because it doesn't work over our previous backgrounds. Uh, shout out to Patricia Dave uh, at Tab Graphics. Uh, for doing our artwork and pretty much giving me exactly what we were asking for. We had some real life selfies we wanted to uh, make it look like they'd been put through a filter, uh, you know, uh, to uh, she, she basically accomplish the look. Uh, so thankfully that's done. Hopefully you'll be seeing our new artwork. You've noticed we got new music. Uh, but yeah, it's part of our rebrand, you know, soft reboot, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, shoot me a message regardless. Um, sorry, you're fine. Where can people find you, Sneezy? <laughs> you can find me on, under Chub Rock Geek on all social medias. I've been uploading game clips to uh, Instagram from Game Night. Uh, I'm going to upload all the funny stuff that has happened uh, in our first session of Baldur's Gate 3 here soon. So if that's something you want to go check out, uh, it'll be on Instagram. Uh, but that's it, folks. Um, again, Witcher 3 next week. 
Um, let me pull up my notes here because I forgot what I wrote down. Yeah, Witcher 3 next week, and uh, we'll see. Well, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.